Today I'm so excited. I have a friend and a colleague, Martha Marks, who is our Democratic candidate running for the state Senate position for the 20th district. And Martha is a hardworking nurse, graduated from the University of Connecticut and has lived in this area for most of her life. She is here to tell us about her platform, why she's running, what is important? Healthcare, of course, as a visiting nurse, is of primary importance to her. But I want her to tell her story and the why. Martha, welcome. Thank you so much for coming. And you're not only a Democratic candidate, I think you're also going to be a Working Family Party candidate as well. Am I correct on yes, that? Yes, I've been endorsed by Working Families well, Party. Well, congratulations. Thank That's you. a task in itself. And then what about the Independent? Do you think you can garner their support as well? Um, we're looking at it. It's. Um, we're looking at it. It's important, yeah. and maybe yeah. you will this time. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, that's great. But Martha, I love your energy. I love what you put out to the world. You know, you're a caring person, working as a nurse your whole life. That takes a special heart. And you're a hero because you worked during the pandemic. You didn't miss a beat. And you're continuing to work full time today while running for a state Senate position. Yeah. That is a task that not many people can do. So I give you my kudos and congratulations. Congratulations on that. But tell me, let's circle back. You're the mother of four children. What is your why, Martha? Why are you running for office? Like, why is it important? Why is this an important thing to sure. be doing right now? Um, sure. Thanks, Kate. Um, and thanks for having me today. So I have been a visiting nurse for the last 20 years. Um, before that, I worked maternal child pediatrics. I worked at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York City on their pediatric floor. And as a nurse, you see how healthcare policy, public policy works and doesn't work. Um, so as I, you know, you think as a nurse that you're gonna be able to solve all the problems and make everything better for the patients that you care for, and I saw that that wasn't the case. That Legislation, needed... policy gets in the way. So you can change that probably a little bit, that's right? That's exactly what I was going to say. Oh, yes. perfect. Okay. You know, good. Yeah, yeah. Good, um, good. So that's why I decided to run, because I feel that we need the middle class voice in Hartford that understands how public policy and healthcare policy truly affect people. And um, one of the main things that really pushed me over was the homemakers and companions that I saw taking care of our elderly people using our taxpayer money. It's usually most of them. It's the um, elder care program, which was just in the paper mm -hmm. um, the other day, where it's much cheaper for the state to keep um, people at home with care at home than it is to put them in a nursing home. And it's sure. better for the person. But I saw how those homemakers and companions were treated um, by the companies that they work for. Mm. And then all of a sudden we see that Hartford HealthCare um, was deducting, I don't know if you read that story, about probably two weeks ago in the day in the Connecticut Mirror and the Post, it was in all of the publications and on NPR, about they were taking $17.50 out of their workers' checks every day for a meal that they did not provide. These are people making less than $15 an hour. So that is over an hour of pay every day. That's criminal. That's really, that's just it was wrong. Criminal. It is criminal. It was criminal. And yeah. it took, when the workers asked, they were just told it was legal what they were doing. Mm. And they had no way of fighting back. Mm. So now I think people finally see that, you know, wow, that's what Martha, Martha's been saying. They haven't been treated well. Mm -hmm. And I want to be the voice. They don't have a big lobby up in Hartford. No, of course not. No. And I want to be the voice because I see every day the people that don't have a big lobby up in Hartford. And um, I want to go up and I want to be their voice. Absolutely. Well, my husband's just been getting training on being an ombudsman for healthcare facilities and has been going through the certification process and understanding all of what goes into that. So I am on the same page as you as far as understanding the yeah. importance of that. But you also have a personal why. Are you comfortable sharing the, the why to begin with? Didn't you have a daughter who had some concerns that needed some special attention? That was yeah, so um, my daughter, Ellen, my fourth child, she had a cleft lip and palate. Mm -hmm. And we it was the summer before she was going into college. Um, she was going to George Washington University. And she was having a big procedure done called a Lafort, where they pull out the jaw. And her insurance had paid for about $20,000 worth of orthodontic work we had done for a whole year going back and forth to New York. And the day before she was supposed to go in for surgery, um, 
um, NYU hospital called and said, your insurance hasn't approved it. Mm. And, you know, we're going to have to cancel the surgery. I'm like, you can't cancel the surgery. So I was on the phone with United Healthcare. My daughter, Jillian, who was in med school at George Washington, just happened to be um, in DC. She went to um, Senator Blumenthal's office. All day long, we worked. There is legislation passed that insurance companies can't say no to a child with a cleft lip and palate for surgery. Mm. But um, Ellen's father works at Electric Boats. That's where the insurance came from. Mm. So they are self-insured. So they don't have to go by the same legislation that um, the legislation that's passed. Both health the healthcare legislation, there is a huge majority of people that don't have to, the companies that don't have to um, abide by that because of how they insure. But that's a whole nother story. Mm. So we finally got it passed at the last minute because um, uh, Senator Blumenthal called um, the HR person at Electric Code and said, what are you doing? Right. But we had the privilege of me knowing how to how do the insurance company works a daughter who was could walk right over to blumenthal's office in dc and that was just that was more stressful for me than her having the surgery i'm sure and it's just it's happened so many times she's had many 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 surgeries right. and it just shouldn't be like that no it shouldn't be like that and the thing that comes to my mind martha is the, just the idea of how much you know because you're in the field and your daughter was in the field and then you had connections with somebody like Senator Blumenthal yes. who had his thumb in the pot and understood the players and could help to manipulate things. And there's so many people who don't know what you know and cannot advocate and don't advocate because they don't even know that there's that opportunity, right? But that's your voice and that's what you would bring forward is what I'm understanding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I will say that that is kind of the catalyst that I always thought I wanted to be in politics. I wasn't sure how you did it. Right. Um, and I read, I think it was on Facebook, that um, Liz Duarte in Groton was having a fundraiser for um, Senator Blumenthal. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to shake that man's hand mm -hmm. myself and say thank you. Mm -hmm. So I go to this house. I knew nobody there. Um, I told my story to him. I got to shake his hand. And at that time, Liz Duarte invited me to join the um, Connecticut Democrat, what was it? Eastern like, Connecticut Democratic, Democratic Women. It's yeah, a big it's law. A big, it's a big acronym. <laughs> I used to know it. Southeastern Connecticut Federation of Democratic Women. Right. And um, I joined that. And I will say Liz Duarte is a huge part of what um, pushed me into running for um, office here in in New London. Mm -hmm. So, and that's how it started. Was just me seeing what politics can do and how legislation works. And you know, I I, I don't know what would have happened to Ellie. That that you know, her whole next year of college would have been completely different. Mm -hmm. Everything would have been different mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. we hadn't gotten that surgery approved. Mm. And how is she now? Oh, she's awesome. She works for Massachusetts Health Policy Commission. Um, she wants to write public health policy because of everything she's been through. Perfect. And she's very involved with um, the different cleft lip and palate and people with facial differences, very involved in, um, there's still a lot of legislation being passed mm. because um, there is still a lot of discrim discrimination. Um, so yeah, there's Well, you know, I'm a speech do. pathologist by yeah. training. So I had a lot of kids, not a lot, but a few, a number of children who yeah. had cleft lip or palate and then worked with them trying to improve. And that surgical procedure can be very onerous and they're repetitive. They're, they're just so not many. one and done. They start early on and it goes through adulthood. So yeah. Yeah, she still goes to her speech. Um, yeah, but we had Miss Cafoni was our speech pathologist and Fred and Frida fell off the roof. We say it all the time, rem remembering oh, 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 that Fred and Frida <laughs> fell off the roof. <laughs> That's funny, um, those little tongue yeah, twisters. Yeah. Wow, getting yeah, lots that. Lots of good people in our lives. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And that's what you do, that's what you develop. Anything more on healthcare? To me, when I think of healthcare, I think it needs to be more accessible and more available, and just there shouldn't be so much red tape and hoops and hurdles that you have to go over and through. Yeah, the hoops and hurdles are getting worse and worse. Um, the institutions that we all work for now are monopolies in Connecticut and um, it's just, I work for one of them. Um, it's disheartening. Uh, 
you know, one of the things that I think very simple that I'd like to get past when I get up to Hartford is that when we have a client that has Husky or Title 19 sure. Medicaid, um, we can't send a social worker out to the home because they have their DSS worker through the state. Um, I think we charge $175 for a social worker visit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And to have a social worker go to your home to sit in your home where you have, you're in control, you don't feel like the victim, you, you know, it's such a whole, just like home care nursing is just different. When you see um, the home, you see the environment. Yeah, and, you and, see... and it just would be so, it would be so helpful mm -hmm. um, to, the, to the patients if that Medicaid would just pay for one or two home social work visits. But the other thing, I mean, that's just a very small thing. But There's it's a lot so of things, important. So yeah. important. And pharmacy, um, are, you know, we have, I, I see this all the time, people get discharged from inpatient um, mental health um, facilities and they're given five days of medication. And, and then you call the primary care doctor who is then supposed to reorder all the meds. It, it, is, it is so backwards and it is so wrong and then they end up not having their meds because nobody will order meds and they end up going back into the hospital um, and the pharmacist, um, I mean, you want to have an interesting conversation, sit and talk to the pharmacist about so many things that, you know, our legislation makes it so difficult for them. So, you know, I have a lot of people that I have to listen to. Um, my biggest thing is choice, is women's reproductive rights. Oh, there you go. And uh, I've been um, championing it since I was a child. Um, my father was an obstetrician and gynecologist. He told us, you know, all the time at the dinner table what happened when um, abortions weren't legal and what he saw women go through and women killed and women butchered by having illegal abortions um, and the right to birth control. Um, you know, there was a time when a woman had to have her husband's um, per permission, permission consent, to right? have yeah. their tubes tied or to go out birth control, which just, I mean, it wasn't that long ago. That no, this gener and, and there's many people out there that want to move it back to that way. Um, you know, we were, my mother was from Ireland, um, eight of us kids, you know, very Irish Catholic. And we were back, you know, in the 70s, we would be at St. Paul's Church in Waterford. And when Father Flint got up there and started talking about abortion, my father stood all of us up and he was 6'6", six, six, so you saw him. And he marched us out of that church because he, you know, he was very, very um, pro-choice. Mm -hmm. I am very pro-choice. I've been, you know, going to every plant Parenthood rally that there's been. People say that it's codified here, that we have nothing to worry about. Um, we do. Um, they're going to do, uh, they're going to try to get um, parental consent passed. And the groups that are very pro-life have said that that is their first, their first little sliver of trying to, you know, get, um, make Connecticut uh, not a safe state like it is now. So we still have work to do. We have to protect um, our right for contraception. Um, there are people that want to take that away. There are people that believe an IUD is a form of abortion. And um, it's just, it's 2022. And it's unbelievable, isn't it? It's just. I just, I wake up someday and I just can't believe it. I just can't believe it's it. It's shocking. It's just really shocking to me. And then the people that say it's just not a big deal, I said, Really? You know, I heard, a re I heard a report about a woman, like if you're in the military and you're in a state that is no longer um, allowing, abortion, yeah, allowing right. abortion, you know, you, you have to ask your supervisor for permission to leave the state when what if that supervisor doesn't have the values that you have? It is, it is just daunting. So those are, if you live, if you, our people that live here in Connecticut, mm -hmm. who then go into the military and go to a state that doesn't have abortion, we need to worry about them. And so that's why, I mean, I truly believe that Democrats are going to get elected up and down the slate because women are angry and women are registering to vote um, 
in numbers that we have not seen before. Well, here's hoping, you know, here's hoping. They are, I right. mean, yeah, women no, I are mean, registering. The, well, and not just registering, but getting out there and, and, and putting their ballot in the box yep. and doing what you need to do to get people who are like-minded elected for these yes. positions. So, yeah. yeah, no, it's a very scary time right now. And in the case of incest or rape still that you would need to, or medical conditions that you would need to carry that baby to gestation, that's amazing, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's just, and it's no one's business why somebody decides to terminate their pregnancy. Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. no one's business. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it, it's your business and, and the physician or nurse practitioner that you're with. And um, one reason is not better or worse than the other. No, reason. of course not. And we're not here to judge. That's no, not our no, job. We no. Are and we have to, to take the stigma away. We have to take the stigma exactly. off. Exactly. It's like mental yeah. health, the stigma that goes yeah. with mental health. And yep. does that fall under your health care? Oh, God, yes. Yes, please tell me. Yeah, because you see a lot of people that are, especially during the pandemic, I have just noticed so much more loneliness and so much more, it's been a more vitriol society. People are angrier and what else? People are probably yeah. some substance. Um, yeah, you, I was lonely. I mean, I went home from work every day. You know, first work was so stressful, not so much afraid of getting COVID, but afraid of getting COVID and giving it to the next person you saw because we didn't have all the tools in the toolbox that we have now. Right. And then I would go home to an empty house mm. every day. I mean, mm. I'm a very social person. Mm. And I'm just now, this is, I'm, it's probably this is the first week that I have not been wearing a mask. Mm. Um, and I still haven't gotten COVID. You haven't. Well, I good have for not. you. Good I for you. Not. And it's because I wear a mask. So I probably should have a mask on. But, um, uh, you know, it, it's been very hard. Um, substance abuse, the opioid ad addiction, I take care of so many patients mm. that um, are in remission. And, and what happens with that? I mean, there probably just isn't the support needed for a lot of our people to be able to get the services and the support and community, the group activities that would prevent or preclude perhaps the development of some of these issues? What is your yeah, opinion? Yeah, well, I mean, I think um, Alliance for Living and uh, some of the nonprofits in New London. I just, I know New London because I'm chair of the Public um, Welfare Committee on City Council. And um, they just really, they, their, their program that they did, and they really went out and found people, and they were doing the saliva test, actually, mm -hmm. through Yale, University, not mm -hmm. through Yale Hospital. Mm -hmm. um, they they work with Yale University. It, 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 if you ever want to have another super interesting um, conversation, conversation, it is the the program that Alliance for Living um, has, and their goal is just to have the whole world out there with Narcan. That everybody has. I I carry Narcan now on me. Mm -hmm. um, is because the only way we're going to prevent the deaths is for everybody to have Narcan to mm. be able to. Um, administer it when you find somebody that has overdosed. But the loneliness is real. Our seniors were very lonely. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of the senior housing going down to the break rooms. Mm. I mean, I, I just remember how sad I was. Mm -hmm. You know, when I walked into 149 Huntington where they would all be downstairs playing pool and dominoes and bingo and cooking. And they couldn't and then be it there. was just empty. Right. It right. was just empty. Right. It was so eerie. So eerie. Um, so it's getting better, but I think people have um, a little PTSD, have a little fear about going out. Absolutely. I think we um, all have to be kind to each other. Um, we don't have the mental health workers to mm -hmm. take care of everybody. Mm -hmm. And the only way we're going to make that better is by treating them with respect and paying them enough money for what they do. Mm. Uh, I mean, you, you should be able to make a decent living being a um, mental health worker, and and you don't. You start at forty or fifty thousand dollars a year when you've gone to school for four years of college. Mm. That's just not okay. Right? No, I know. Right? It's just not okay, and that's how you're going to make it better. To make it to be a profession that you can go into, that you can live a, a nice life, live mm -hmm. the American dream. Mm -hmm. well, I so. started to work at the New London Community Meal Center and I've been doing that since November, volunteering once a week and now I'm on the board over there. So we see a lot of the people that are living really struggling lives, you know. I mean, some of them are just really happy and, you know, bring joy to the community center when we're there, the New London Community Meal Center. 
and others you can just see are just really down and out and down on their luck and housing is a real issue Such a lot of our issue. people yeah what can we do for that well for housing I mean I, I go into I deal with housing every day I mm -hmm. go to the homeless hospitality center you know everybody says in New London, we have to put in more um, affordable, low-income housing. The problem is, is that we're not going to get the money no. from HUD because we already have well over the amount of housing that we need legally right. to support um, the people that can't pay two thousand dollars for a two-bedroom. Um, so it is the other towns. It's the it's the surrounding towns. It's an area issue. It's, it it's is. A regional it's issue. a regional issue, and um, I think the apartments that are going in right in next Waterford, to you, uh -huh. yeah, right next to you, I believe that those are mixed income, mixed, I think so. mixed use, which is that it's kind of based on what your income is, how much you can pay. Right. And that's how Victoria Gardens is. Well, and if you're only making $20 an hour, which is not the minimum wage, it's above minimum wage, and food and gas and everything else, healthcare is expensive. How can you afford any kind of a rent above and beyond that? Plus, how can you afford a car? Anything. How can you afford anything, right? Yeah. 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 But what if you're making fifteen dollars an hour? Yeah. I mean. Yeah. 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 It's very prohibitive. Yeah. It is very prohibitive. And you know, the other thing was the acce accessible dwelling units. Mm. Was um, that was desegregate CT really pushed that legislation, and they're a brilliant, wonderful group to follow um, on their their web page. But a lot of the um, towns, the planning and zoning did not pass it, that they don't, don't want the, accept, the accessory dwelling units, which just says you can build like onto your house a or little apartment. if you have an apartment. extra room, right? If you have an extra room, can't you make that available to somebody? Well, I you thought, can do that anyways. Right, right, right. Yeah, so. I think it's the most is four people can't live in a house that aren't related, don't quote me, but I think that's... Because it was always like the Golden Girls were actually like breaking the law on yeah, that TV yeah. show because they had too many of them. Um, well, so the one yeah. was mother daughter. So yeah, I guess. Um, so you know, it's putting those accessory, you know, dwelling units on. It's just it's sad that we don't build the small developments where you have a bunch of ranches and small capes like you know Montville manor or um some of the streets off of fog plain i remember when i was little they're just lots of small ranches yeah, yeah, yeah. that people buy them as their starter home mm -hmm. and then you can either stay there forever and add on as your family grows or you you sell it and you get the equity and you you go and move up bigger i mean that's what all of the young engineers and teachers and police officers and nurses that's what you did when right. you first got a house right. and it just they're not there anymore no. but you know and it's a lot of the zoning laws where people want certain size acres in a lot of the towns and that's up to the towns um but i think the towns have to really look at uh look at this as it is an area problem mm. and you can't say that you care about it but then say not in my backyard right it has to be everybody's problem yeah. we have to care about our yeah. neighbor yeah. so you mentioned labor laws is something that you're very passionate about let's touch yeah. on that for a minute yep so one of the very simplest labor laws that's been driving me crazy for years that i haven't understand why it hasn't changed is there's a law that says you can't like you wouldn't you think working six days in a row is the most you should have to work mm. i mean it's exhausting mm. Um, so the law says you can't work more than six days in a work week. Mm. So our work week goes from Saturday to, to um, goes from Sunday to Saturday. So if I work Monday through Saturday, that's six days. Mm. That's the work week. Mm. They then can mandate me to come in on Sunday mm. and mandate me to work from Sunday to Friday. So is this? So then I'm working twelve days mm. in a row. Mm. I don't. Sometimes I want to work 12 days in a row if I want a big paycheck. Mm -hmm. But as I approach 60, I don't want to work 12 days in a row. Well, everyone needs a break. Everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, but you shouldn't have to. That right. should be your choice. So it's just getting rid of the word work week. Mm -hmm. um, and who defines work week? Is it the company? The or? company. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. however, however your company builds. Okay. Builds okay. Is, um, well, and I used to work part time at a clothing store, and the clothing store would have you close, and you'd be there till one o'clock in the morning, and then open, and then those shifts were kind of like back to back. Yeah. And then you couldn't predict in advance 
what your shift would be. And to me, it got really crazy. And it wasn't so hard for me, but some of the people who worked another job or had children yep. and young children. It or was, they tell, oh, they call you an hour before and say that they cancel your shift mm. or call you an hour and say you have to be in. So Working Families Party, that's one of their big in initiatives, nice. is fair scheduling. Yes. And you do. We have to look at families. I mean, we want to be this country that takes care of each other and takes care of our families. Then we have to be kind about how you expect people to work. Right. And, you know, people need to be able to pay their bills that, you know, you have to have a business plan where you know how to schedule in order to give people a fair work week. Exactly. Um, you know, like we have, if you get called into work a per diem, you are guaranteed for eight hours. It depends on the day. But, you know, you have, to, and then when that happens, management thinks a little differently about maybe calling you in for something that's trivial, where mm -hmm, you're really mm -hmm, not needed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so yes, there's, I mean, the fair scheduling laws are very big. Um, safe staffing and nursing is very important to me. Um, that's going to be a big hurdle. That's probably going to take us quite a few legislative sessions to get, but mm. it's something we're going to start. Mm -hmm. Well, Martha, this time has just really flown by. I just saw that we only have about three minutes left, and I know we've touched a little bit on economics, but then there's energy, environment, education, equity, diversity, transportation. Which one do you want to tackle? Um, I guess equity. Okay, let's talk diversity. about diversity. Yep. I think we DEI. have to. Yep. Yeah, and it's, you know what? It's a lot of newsletters yes. and a lot of Zoom meetings where you watch a movie. Mm -hmm. We need to put people in the room where they have those they uncomfortable conversations, have right? those yeah. questions that when you hear a certain name or when you get sent to a certain address, you have a, an immediate bias that comes to your mind mm. and which that's that's human. We all have to admit that at times we have biases. Of course. Um, and then you challenge that bias and you talk to others. Um, you know, the, the, the transgender community is just so put on the um, being punched around right now. Mm -hmm. And if you have the privilege of knowing somebody, you know, that identifies as trans, um, I have quite a few f people that I call friends. Celebrate you, that, right? Yeah. You, it's just, it, it's the new normal, as my daughter Ellie likes to say, that it does become so, oh, like, it's not a big deal. Right. But people need to meet other people. You need to sit in a room and you need to have hard conversations. And I think DEI has kind of taken on... Um, it, it, it's not the way we wanted it to happen. Let's mm -hmm. just say that. I mm -hmm. mean, it's just not. There's still a lot of microaggressions out there, even to women. Of course. And that we really have to have hard conversations in a safe place. Absolutely. Um, with somebody leading it. And I just, I think some of that um, legislation has to be looked at. Lovely. Okay. Yeah. Well, Martha, where do we go to find out more? Where do we go to volunteer? Where should we, how can we help you? How can we support your candidacy? Yes, I just did a video this morning. So it's... Um, um, we do need help. Uh, we need to be knocking doors and making phone calls. So it's um, marksforsenate at gmail.com. M-A-R-X. Yep, like Groucho. And um, F-O-R or the number? F-O-R. F-O-R. Senate. Yep. S -E -N -A -T -E. And you can go onto my Facebook page, um, marks for ct and you can just message us there or, or comment there. And then my... Um, my uh, website is Martha Marks for Senate. Okay, and election day is? November 8th. November 8th, put that on your calendar, yeah. and we want voting to be accessible, and we want good voter turnout, so we need to encourage we your do. friend, don't just vote, bring a friend along, bring a family member, bring your neighbor, but vote, get out yes. there and vote, because it makes a difference, right? It does. And we know that. Yeah. Martha, thank you for running. Thank you, I know it how was much, wonderful. Thank you, I know how much energy it takes to run, <sighs> and yeah. keep up the good work, so Thanks. thank you. Thank you.